Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, depending where you are in the world. Uh, thanks for joining this TELET webinar, Optimizing Factories with Artificial Intelligence and Connectivity Management in the Race to Productivity. I'm Amanda Slink, the head of global events here at TELET, and I'll be moderating our event today. Um, let's get to know our speaker real quick. Uh, to explain this topic today, I am pleased to be joined by John Kiever, the CTO for IoT Platforms at TELET. Hey, John, thanks for joining. Thank you. Uh, now, before I hand it over to John to start our presentation, I've got uh, just a few quick comments. Um, I would like to remind our audience that we will have time to answer some questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, simply submit a question by posting in the questions box, which will be located near the bottom of your screen. Uh, we'll do our best to try to get to them all today. Uh, also, please be sure to check out the resources section for some additional information on our topic. Um, and finally, we will send out a replay link uh, to all the attendees at the conclusion of our webinar. Um, so be on the lookout for that. And uh, with that, John, I will hand it over to you to kick us off today. Okay, thank you, Amanda. Well, let's take a look at this. Optimizing factories with AI and connectivity management in the race to productivity. That's definitely a mouthful. There's no question in today's domain with supply chain challenges that optimizing factories is critical to us. Now, the opportunity to start applying artificial intelligence and connectivity management is really a key element of how people approach their productivity solutions. And that's what we're here really to talk about is how can we leverage these technologies uh, in the capability of, of improving and optimizing our processes within the manufacturing domain. If we take a look at the things that TELIT addresses kind of in the broad spectrum uh, from the things, the industries and sites, basically whether it's your device, whether it's something on the shop floor or it's a machine or a piece of equipment moving you know, uh, across the domain or uh, the capability to support your clouds, your servers and the applications you have back at headquarters, really the challenge is bridging those two endpoints. And that's really one of the things that TELIT does best is connect to those dots end to end. Uh, whether you're looking at cellular modules because you're in a completely wireless infrastructure, whether it's uh, Wi-Fi, BLE, cellular, the capability to provide that capability, the connectivity plans to provide you know, a broad scale global uh, type of uh, connection so devices move around uh, very cleanly without a lot of rework and, and a lot of additional you know, uh, requirements to support different uh, topography there as they move, or you're looking at your software and platforms, which is largely what we're going to be focusing focused on here today is how do we leverage software at the edge, software in the cloud to provide some of these solutions for connectivity management and artificial intelligence uh, in, in the context of manufacturing optimization. Uh, if you take a look at our history dating back to the 2000 time frame at the time, uh, we had been part of IBM for about 20 years developing technology used broadly for IBM manufacturing. Um, and then broke that off as a company very focused on software for the edge and the cloud. Uh, Telet uh, acquired us in 2013 to form the platform's line of business. And along with that came our SecureWise product for secure collaboration within the semiconductor and, and other highly uh, secure IP intensive uh, domains. But today we're going to be focusing on how device-wise from an edge product uh, can be used to take advantage of uh, artificial intelligence uh, extensions uh, as well as you know connectivity management extensions so that we can help you effectively you know connect your solutions from the inside out as we move forward um going on We've been in the domain for a number of years. Uh, customers uh, have been with us for a number of years, continue to grow, lots of recognition. Uh, I like uh, the way ABI Research categorized us uh, in terms of, uh, you know, kind of a visionary uh, in terms of how we brought the technology together, how we look at high performance uh, and, uh, you know, rich functionality as part of our product solutions. Um, it's very exciting that we've been recognized as Industrial IoT Company of the Year, so we continue uh, to get that recognition as we move forward. So uh, we've got a good track record, and uh, we have every intention of, of enhancing and exceeding our customers' ex expectations when we engage. Let's start kind of very fundamentally here, uh, not spend a lot of time on it, but at least uh, think about the context of a plant floor. Uh, most people look at their factory floor and they say, okay, yes, we've got uh, uh, machineries, we've got people, our personnel is critical to the process, we've got a process, 
we're not sure necessarily if it's working always the right way. We're not even sure all the details and challenges we have to deal with. Uh, but again, uh, a lot of companies run this way, a lot of clipboards, a lot of Excel spreadsheets, moving data uh, back and forth that way, uh, you know, with the daily or weekly meetings. Um, when you kind of step to the next level of uh, uh, of the process, uh, you kind of, you know, get a little bit more, uh, um, you know, exposure to what's going on, whether you're looking at personnel interacting with machines, whether you're looking at AGVs crossing the floor, whether you're looking at robots uh, moving materials or performing assembly uh, types of operation, welding, et cetera, or you're looking at controls at any level, controls within a piece of equipment, controls on a conveyor line, um, controls upstream uh, at a broader level. Uh, all of this stuff interconnected back into the software and the systems that keep the plant running. You might have a QA department using Oracle databases to collect specific data about how things are being done or how quickly things are being done. You may have SAP as your enterprise resource planning where you're looking at how are we moving forward you know what components are ready for shipment what you know um items do we need to buy to keep production running? Or you may be pushing information up to a cloud like AWS so they can be shared across factories, across locations, or even uh, within a, a dealer infrastructure so they know when a piece of equipment is going to be shipping to a customer. All of these types of things pretty much come together to take that same shop floor that you were looking at a moment ago uh, where we were looking at, okay, clipboard level and Excel spreadsheet into a highly connected industrial IoT factory infrastructure. And we're going to be talking about how we can leverage technology to enhance this even more uh, during this session. A um, little busy chart here, but a lot is being said. What I want you to focus on is kind of the yellow lines, and we will start, you know, from the bottom of the chart and work upward. You'll notice that this chart is kind of split along the middle between connected factories down, downstream and connected machines upstream. Um, and that's because the, the world today, many of the products that are being manufactured are transitioning to be, you know, fully connected products. And so you have to look at the context both inside the plant as well as at the product level and, and tell it's very uh, capable of supporting you on both of those efforts. Let's focus, though, on the connected factory first. You know, we've got this concept of the device-wise product for factory there at the heart of the situation. You've got connections and protocols downstream into your manufacturing assets. You've got connections and protocols upstream uh, into the enterprise systems that you need to get the data to. Uh, and then, of course, you've got <clears throat> the need for visualization at the operator level, at the supervisor level, at the, at the executive level uh, as well, uh, you know, that you're dealing with within either the four walls of the plant or across a broad spectrum of plants, you know, for industrial or industry 4.0 uh, type of approaches. But you also have new technologies coming to bear there as well, whether it's uh, visual inspection, whether you're starting to use machine learning and, and, and uh, pattern recognition uh, for, you know, for anomaly detection, things of that nature. You've got private 5G finding its way to the shop floor to allow us to start reducing, you know, the cost of copper and whatnot that goes into some of the solutions and provide much more flexible manufacturing. So you've got all of these dynamics with the yellow lines connecting all the endpoints. So the need to keep those connections there to be able to manage those connections and, and support uh, the ability to connect to start with is all you know, a critical part of what DeviceWise brings to the table. If we step above the connected you know, factory line into the connected machines, it simply expands to the world of mobility where now you may have a piece of equipment in agriculture, you know, industrial. It might be an AGV that's controlled over 5G. It might be you know, some piece of construction equipment as well that's not only being looked at from an asset management perspective, but now an operations perspective. It may even be moving to the world of uh, agriculture where you're in autonomous machinery, whether it's in the field under its own control. So all of these types of systems still work, but those connections, those yellow lines are still there um, that need to be managed and controlled as well. And you'll see the heart here kind of turns into the remote access or remote monitoring uh, part of the solution. So you have the capability, whether you're talking about a piece of equipment in the field where the piece of equipment is communicating upstream into a cloud platform, uh, you know, pick one, you know, not just tell it, but the ability to support that end-to-end -end infrastructure is an important part of what DeviceWise, you know, brings to bear uh, in this particular solution set. 
let's drill in a little bit more. If we drill into what you're just looking at, instead of focusing on the yellow lines, we drill down to the actual gateway level. You start looking at all of the things that are required for those connections. You've got to have the, the protocol handlers to talk to the devices. You've got to have uh, the you know adapters to connect upstream into the enterprise. You need local logic at the edge to basically do data translation, data transformation. Uh, and this is where obviously we start having the capability to bring edge machine learning in as well. So you can start leveraging intelligence at the edge. So all of these types of things are going on there. You may be supporting simply a visualization upstream to see what's going on for your operators or your management, or you may be pushing data upstream into AWS, Azure, you know, Google Cloud, IBM Watson for a broader scale solution set. And then you see the device-wise cloud is there as well in our cellular connectivity. That's to allow us to support you at both the device management level and a connectivity management level. So the capability to bring all of these ingredients together uh, to provide the best possible solution, you know, for your uh, requirements is, is what we're here to talk about and how we can, you know, support that. Let's talk about Industry 4.0 for a moment. Very exciting kind of translation, you know, we're from our different uh, industrial revolutions to industry, you know, 4.0 and the fourth industrial revolution is to look at the move to more hyper-connected, uh, um, you know, cyber physical systems. The road to get there, though, you know, you have to kind of pass Industry 3.0 before you can achieve Industry 4.0. And this is where something we've been working with for really the last 20 years comes to bear. Very complex, heterogeneous you know, equipment, lots of different protocols and interfaces, and the need to connect those endpoints. In addition to that, a lot of times, you know, although people will use a basic product, they will go in and do customization uh, and homegrown extensions to that. And that's simply, you know, meeting the need uh, of that particular customer. And we recognize that. So that we realize is one of the biggest things that people have to recognize as they start their move or their digital transformation into Industry 4.0 is addressing the basic challenges of Industry 3.0 first. It's kind of like, you know, building a structure. If you don't have a good foundation, most likely your structure may not, you know, be as stable or as reliable as it needs to be. And that's the same on a factory floor. If you don't have that framework to that address kind of the, the connectivity requirements of Industry 3.0, your Industry 4.0 is going to be a bit of a challenge. Um, if we take a look at uh, that, you know, the kind of the impact on the industrial edge processing, in Industry 3.0, we typically lived in a very hierarchical model. We did the connections, we got the data to flow, uh, but you might be dealing down at a device or controlled level, or you might be dealing up at an MES or an enterprise level at the top end of that. A lot of people refer to the Purdue model from the late 1990s, uh, where they pretty much had identified those five layers and then started to focus on how things bridge the gap uh, end to end. As we step into Industry 4.0, the entire game changes. Uh, you're moving into a hyper connected domain where devices at every level have the ability to communicate to a device at any other level. You're not passing through a hierarchy kind of mother may I type of model anymore. You're passing through a direct, I have an event that needs to go to this endpoint because notification is critical, uh, you know, maybe in, in the field. It may not even be something specific to the shop floor. Um, so as these more mature cyber physical systems come together, the need to have this distributed network infrastructure, this managed connectivity in place is critical because, again, it doesn't stay within the four walls of the smart factory. It extends out into the connected world as well. So that's, you know, where a lot of what DeviceWise brings to bear is exciting. Back a number of years ago when we were introducing devices to the market, it was always referred to as disruptive technology. They're like, okay, so you're kind of upsetting the apple cart here because you're jumping uh, layers. You're providing people software that doesn't just move to the layer above it. You know, it doesn't cleanly move from, say, a SCADA level to an MES level, and then another product takes it from the MES level to the ERP level. You're providing a piece of technology that literally allows any one of the levels to communicate upstream or downstream to any one of the other levels based upon the business need. And so this is very important to this whole concept of Industry 4.0. So it's very well positioned to start enabling uh, the digital transformation to Industry 4.0. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more um, further on in the presentation. But it's something uh, to be aware of that the capabilities that device-wise brings the table kind of as 
that aggregation point and, and Swiss Army and I to connect the dots uh, can be done at the lowest level, at the controller or sensor level, all the way up to the cloud and, and enterprise level. Now let's drill in a little bit on artificial intelligence. I referenced that in the opening. Um, lots of both perceived and actual challenges to overcome in this domain. Uh, very exciting, you know, clearly uh, kind of a, a next, uh, um, you know, inflection point of computing, if you will. But there's certain things that are fundamental to it ever being successful. We've got a couple of references here from one of the IBM Business Partner Forums. So they looked and said, from a perspective of data, 60% of organizations are challenged in managing data quality. And we'll talk about that in a moment as well and how DeviceWise helps to address that. From a standpoint of talent, you know, they're challenged to acquire talent to deliver full AI. Well, that's not a surprise. Lots of uh, pieces, parts come together to make that happen. But also from a perspective of trust, there seems to be this mindset uh, that you'll need to blindly trust what the system tells you. Uh, and clearly, we're not there yet. We may not be there yet, you know, for, for, for decades. I mean, the, the bottom line is the, the solutions we're looking at in manufacturing are well-bounded. So the capability to bring machine learning and AI to bear there versus some kind of broad-scale, all-knowing, all-thinking artificial intelligence concept that you see in movies is probably not a rational perspective to, uh, to, you know, to deal with. Um, and that's where we talk about something called narrow AI. It's very focused. It's, it's just simple. It makes sense. And most things, you crawl, walk, run. And artificial intelligence, machine learning, it's no different. We're going to start with very focused solutions. And the nice thing is in the, the context of manufacturing uh, operations, we can do that. You're looking at, is it vibrating? Okay, is it good quality? You know, uh, is the person safe? You know, much more focus solution sets than these broad decision-making things. And, and that's really how you define success in the concept of manufacturing. So from a point of, of, of narrow AI, we're very application-specific. It's limited to a handful of tasks, so it can be bounded and the decisions can be achieved. I'm not saying it's going to be easy to necessarily get there quickly, but you can leverage the capability of uh, you know, the, the uh, machine learning and, and AI technology to get there. Over time, we're general purpose AI will, 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 will fall into place. But for right now, we've got to, again, build that foundation to get there. Because in a moment, you know, if you take a look at the kind of the spectra, you'll understand that machine learning is really a subset of artificial intelligence, which is really a subset of data, you know, uh, um, science. So we'll, we'll talk about that. The basic challenges that you have at, a, at, a, at an actual level in creating a solution based upon machine learning is pretty straightforward. I mean, the concept of, of uh, machine learning uh, is, 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 okay, I perceive my environment. Uh, I detect patterns or anomalies to patterns. I update my understanding of the environment and I make a decision and I go do it again. And that's pretty much the, the, at the highest level, the fundamental concept that you're dealing with. Not a lot of surprise other than the fact that now you have inference as data changes to change how you make a decision. It's not a binary yes, no, high, low. Um, but the kind of the four main challenges you've got to deal with is first in creating that model is how are we going to make the decisions? And most of the time, the challenges of having good quality data is there. We call it dirty data in the context of where you've got outliers, you've got misleading data patterns, or you're looking at bias data, you know some particular failure modes, so you bias the whole concept of the model along those failure modes rather than having a, a broader view uh, with a, a more, uh, you know, I guess a more, you know, uh, uh, you know, a broader uh, inference model to make that decision, uh, and that kind of is what it leads into the whole concept of inappropriate modeling, um, where you may, you know, be started starting out with the context of here's where we believe the six things are that we should be looking for, and consequently that influences uh, how the model, uh, uh, you know, gets executed, and then finally a lack of transparency. How is this information shared with with other systems as well. I uh, this, of course, in the corporate domain comes. There's a lot of things that control this. You know, you know, security practices, uh, who has need to what data. But in the manufacturing domain on the shop floor, it's a little more open. How could other subsystems within the process benefit by having access to some of this decision making? 
Um, and years ago, we used to have feed forward and feed backward control on the similar lines. And I'm sure over time, the same context will grow out of machine learning and AI, uh, because once you make a decision, it typically affects things downstream of where you are. Uh, let's just take a moment, though, and, t and look at how kind of AI and ML uh, really stack up. And many times those terms are used interchangeably, and it's simply not true. Uh, you've got kind of a subset of it all, the core algorithms and things of that nature fall in the classification of machine learning. That's where we start out, focused on building the model, things of that nature. Uh, when you expand beyond that to a broader scope of AI, that's where you're able to start doing the and understanding the interpretation and inference, as we call it, to make the decisions. Okay, so you can have an ML-based system, but technically the concept above that is AI is where the decision is being made. The most important thing to take away from this chart, though, is you can't have ML or AI without data science. Data is the fundamental context of it all. And that's why products like devices are so very important. You've got to have clean data. You've got to have high integrity data. You've got to have data at the right time. So as you build that model and then execute against that inference, that you're doing that effectively uh, with solid data. But this is something just to bear in mind. The nice thing is it also kind of opens the door to the fact that you can start small. You don't have to go out in the domain of artificial intelligence and boil the ocean from day one. Uh, and that's you know, obviously the the right way to solve most problems. I like to always fall back to this uh, this somewhat dated chart, but it's a cyber physical systems maturity chart that came out a number of years ago from Science Direct, and then it was kind of a good perspective uh, and almost a history lesson with a little bit of a forward-looking uh, tenure to it as well. Obviously, over the last 20, 30 years and more, we've been worried about connections. How do we sense things? Uh, how do we connect that together? How do we get accurate readings and information uh, so that we can introduce components? So that was really just fundamental condition monitoring. Okay, is it hot? Is it cold? Is it fast? Is it slow? On or off? All the basics, okay? And then we started to grow beyond it into more of a conversion and a prognostics domain, but creating self-awareness, if you will, across different machines. And, and these could be machines of the same type. They could be machines of different type, but share physical commonalities and maybe the way they're, 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 they're powered or the way the motors, the, the derived kind is built. So you can start doing some correlations that way. You kind of step in the next level to more of the cyber domain, and I'd say that's kind of where we are at this point in time, where we're looking at groups of machines, fleets of machines. We're doing more peer-to-peer -peer comparisons. If you have vibration monitors along a line, how are those three or six, uh, you know, accelerometers looking? You know, are, do they look radically different? Do they have similarities? Uh, if you look at them from a completely isolated black box approach, do they yield the same results? But it's only at this level that we really start having the capability to kind of yield a cyber physical system that, you know, is, is critical to the vision of Industry 4.0 because you're starting to be able to do uh, the self-comparison. And that opens the door for cognition. Obviously, you hear a lot about cognitive systems. You've got, you know, the, the Watson's, the AWS's, the, the, the Google. You know, where we have a lot of capabilities to start applying higher end, um, you know, intelligence. And that truly yields finally, you know, the, the view and, and the goal of decision support systems but to help us prioritize and optimize our decisions. And that's obviously the goal of everything we're doing in the context here device wise and our family of products become a feeder into this. And of course, you know, the, the vision here is to get to a, a truly uh, you know, uh, intelligent supervisory infrastructure where the infrastructures are able to say, okay, I know how to avoid some of these uh, actions or some of these incidents based upon what I have learned and what I've understood up through my decision support system. So this is a good little reference as you're thinking about, uh, you know, uh, digital transformation and kind of the next step of, of that path you may want to go down in the context of your particular uh, solution and your particular factory. Um, if we just take a quick, you know, few few minutes here to look at how you know AI has been deployed in industry today, lots of things around safety and security are the right people at the right place with the right tools at the right time, uh, or are they there when they're not supposed to be, or are they doing something wrong? Whether it's uh, you know trucks on a dock or or, or, or people inside uh, you know the building on the loading dock, you know uh, you know loading the trucks, the ability to leverage that. As we've matured a little bit and, and gotten more 
more focused on things like safety. Maybe it's in a warehouse. You know, are things properly stacked? Is anything stacked too high? Is anything cluttering the aisles that may cause, you know, a forklift to, to veer the wrong way and cause damage or, or injury? Uh, those types of things at a safety level. At a productivity level, are the bottles in a line? Do we see the same pattern of caps? Do we see the same spacing? The ability to very quickly take snapshots on the fly and then make decisions to say the system is running well. It's really, you know, uh, vision as a sensor in, in many cases, but the capability to leverage this uh, is, is things that uh, we're starting to leverage today. This is a solution. Uh, uh, from smart, smart cognition, I think it's a very nice solution for safety where they actually show the scenario where they recognize if you see the green bounded region, it says, yes, there's an operator there. He's recognized. He's got a, a safety helmet on. Uh, he's got the, 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 the safety vest on. He's got gloves on. Unfortunately, they're not the right color gloves, so they're not the right gloves for doing this the, the project that he's working on. Oh, and oh, by the way, he's standing next to a conveyor that has an exposed chain, so it's a safety hazard for him to be there. The ability to bring all of this information in through a visual view with the inference on the back end, you know, from, from building the, the visual model, to be able to say, okay, we have a PPE exposure, we've had this many PPE exposures over time, and here this one's highlighting the gloves uh, to start with as you look into the frame. Uh, but then be able to see where those occur and how those occur. This is real world you know, solution based upon AI, but the opportunity here is how do we make it easier? That is obviously the first and foremost thing uh, that's going to be the challenge, I think, for broader scale deployment. I'll give you a little solution here. This is a demonstration we actually run here at the lab uh, for customers when they come visit. It's, it's based on visual inspection, very simple, four wheels and are the proper number of lug nuts uh, installed you know, within the four wheels. And we use edge-based machine learning to do that. Um, I'll show you in a moment the model that we built uh, in excess of 100 photos, uh, in excess of four hours on IBM Watson to create the model. Of, of continuous you know, crunching for it to come up with it. But the ability to take this then and use it during runtime to, to get physical signals from I.O. through a logic controller into a gateway, having that information you know, published upstream, visualized through AWS, process the Maximo visual inspection with IBM Watson uh, so that you can get a real-time operator dashboard or, you know, uh, stack light saying things are good, things are bad, uh, or we've got, uh, you know, we've got uh, defect in the products. Um, and this is what it basically would look like. You know, what you see here in kind of the upper left-hand corner is where we built the model uh, and, and took several hours of processing to do that so that we could download it into the uh, Edge device and, 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 and take advantage uh, of the you know, graphical processors within that to do the visualization in real time uh, and then be able to quickly identify, okay, we've got the proper assembly there in the right location or, okay, we're missing one you know, or, or missing two or have none. Uh, and the ability to highlight that, that is a real world scenario of machine learning. Now, you don't see this. The, the typical operator, what you see on the shop floor is the physical um, you know, arm. Off to the right here, you see there's a pick area where, where the tires would be coming into place. Uh, and then you have a place area where the lug nuts would be installed. Uh, and then we can pick the camera you see off to the left there and then start the inspection process and, and do all of that inspection in a matter of seconds. Um, to say, okay, these are four wheels. Here you see the robots placing two defective wheels in the back left corner, and that's because in this particular scenario, you know, there was a, you know, it looks like a left front and a right rear uh, wheel weren't properly, uh, you know, uh, assembled. So real world application, though, taking advantage of some machine learning and AI. But at the end of the day, it's all about achieving this Industry 4.0 goal, and digital maturity is kind of the stairway there. Uh, you know, you know, we and we start with the same recipe. There's no surprise here. You start with the basics. You know, what data is available? What tags can I get access to in the system? Okay, and we pull that in. And then how do we connect to that? How do we bring it in? How fast do we bring it in? And then based upon that digital maturity item number three is, okay, what's happening? Based upon what we're seeing, you know, are things under control or things out of control? And understanding why that's happening, you will see that each one of these steps 
uh, basically adds the maturity of how you're solving the problem or what you're doing uh, with the resultant data that you obtain all the way up through, I don't know about products that never break <laughs> in the seventh tier uh, of the maturity, but at the same time, a truly transformed business is going to allow you to be able to leverage your business models uh, much more effectively. And But it's all a journey. I will tell you, uh, I know uh, my son tells me I'm digitally challenged all the time because I think a cell phone is for making phone calls, doing texts, and taking a picture every now and then. And he looks at it as a quad core computing device for, you know, for business processing and gaming. And he, he, he we call it, you know, the digital challenge. But anyhow, it is the reality. How do we leverage uh, the capability that we have within the four walls and, and beyond of a manufacturing plan or a process to take advantage of these newer technologies to get there, you know, and, 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 and optimize what we're doing? If we take it, it you know, from the, the basic, you know, tiered levels, device access layer is still critical, part of the industry 3.0, critical to industry 4.0. Uh, at both ends, the capability to hit enterprise level, uh, you know, uh, there and available to do, you know, the upstream management of the of the corporate process and, and keeping the business going. But in the middle, the ability to leverage ed edge logic, you know, to take advantage of machine learning at the edge, uh, to take advantage of, of, of basic uh, operations and data transformation, all of those types of things uh, are a you know, part and parcel of what DeviceWise does. So it's an excellent tool to help you, you know, get on the path of transforming your corporation or your processes digitally and achieving that Industry 4.0 goal. If we take a look at it, simply put across all these levels from the most basic integration and automation at the fundamental tier, uh, whether it's controls, robotics, RFID, CNC, torque, operators, you know, humans interact with the system, all of these things all the way up through, okay, I'm, I'm working with databases, I'm working with enterprise systems, I'm providing, you know, a visualization, I'm, I'm working with cloud infrastructure so that on the back end, maybe we're doing, you know, some uh, analytics and, and, and uh, AI in the back end, but the ability to enable any one of these tiers uh, is is a key part of what DeviceWise, you know, offers the customer and enables. So hopefully, uh, you know, we've been able to cover some of that and kind of address uh, how it is an important ingredient in, into your recipe uh, for digital transformation and, and really optimizing your productivity every start back. How do we handle our connectivity management? How do we leverage some AI uh, in this race to productivity? So hopefully this has been informative. You know, reach out to us. Uh, we'll be glad to speak with you. Uh, be glad to uh, to uh, roll up our sleeves and understand your particular requirements and needs and, and how to work together uh, to move forward in your particular challenges uh, on the shop floor uh, and digital transformation. Uh, but uh, thank you so much and uh, look forward to uh, entertaining some questions. John, thank you uh, so much. That was such a such a great presentation here. Um, before we get to the questions, I am going to drop a poll on your screen, audience. Um, if you'd like to have one of our experts contact you directly, um, please respond here on the poll, and we will be sure to get someone to reach out to you. Um, like John said, we do have time for some questions now. Um, there is still time to ask the question, so please feel free to submit um, using the box at the, the bottom of your screen there. Um, we'll do our best to cover it in the time we've got left here. Um, John, we've gotten a couple of questions, and so we'll just kind of dive right in here. Um, first question I see, you referenced several challenges uh, facing broad deployment of ML and AI in manufacturing. Um, what do you consider the biggest single challenge solutions providers face in the context of ML and AI? Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, the, the, the challenge here is solution providers. I mean, obviously, we've got to take a look at how do we bound the solutions we bring to market in the context of machine learning AI, and how do we make the configuration easy? And the, as I talked in the slides, the model making is one of the hardest parts. Now, how do we overcome that? Uh, that is the challenge, and, and whether it's you know having the system go through some kind of automated process where it initially 
you know, collects data where it works to build a uh, model automatically. There's a lot of great research going on right now about how uh, to synthesize models. So I think that's going to be the single biggest thing, to get away from the lab experiments and really come up with some bounded solutions. And I've got some, there are there are companies taking these steps now to provide products uh, that are very well defined that actually leverage machine learning, but get you going quickly uh, and then allow the system to start learning from that. So I think, you know, the takeaway there would be, you know, make sure they're well defined, bounded solutions and make sure they're easy to configure and get going. You know, that's that's what I would say the biggest challenges are uh, to the, uh, you know, to the actual solution providers today. Thanks, John. Um, this next question kind of goes hand in hand with the last one too. Um, what is the hardest part of deploying um, an ML AI project for manufacturing? Yeah, that's uh, that's uh, uh, <laughs> that could go from the sublime to ridiculous. But the two most challenging things are the data cleansing and the model generation. Uh, without good data, without you know, you know. Without you know unbiased data, you're going to very have a hard time creating a representative model. Um, you know, model generation is a very iterative process. It takes time and it takes skill. And this is where you know I think that you know the, the most focus is going to be for the for the solution providers as well as the people doing their their initial projects. As they're going to get well, whether it's initial or, or project number ten, they're still going to have to go through that model generation um, and, and and take the time to do it. Like I said, even for our little wheel inspection process, we had over 100 photos of those wheels of positions just so we could build that model uh, to give us, you know, a, a, like a 98% plus, you know, a, a, you know, confidence level that we would be able to identify a defect versus a quality product. Great, thanks, John. Um, next question I have: um, Are manufacturing automation? Oh, sorry, manufacturing automation customers already seeing payback and tangible benefits um, from deploying these solutions? Well, actually, there are. Uh, you know, it's very comforting. I'm on a lot of calls, and I hear a lot of feedback about what people are doing. But there's a number of production scenarios, again, very well bounded, you know, that are starting to benefit from machine learning AI. And these range from the safety type of applications I showed you to a broader predictive maintenance where you, you have some – you've got condition-based monitoring feeding it, but then you're actually learning using a model to decide, you know, is, you know, is this bearing, you know, out of bounds – that need to be replaced? Does this belt need to be, you know, replaced? Things of that nature. Visual inspection clearly uh, is is a big active success area right now, uh, where uh, even in engine assembly, where with one shot, you know, at specific angles, uh, comparing against the model, they're able to define up to, or identify up to 16 different success or failure points, you know, and, and those types of things. Energy optimization, you know, looking at, you know, bo boiler control mechanics, how can that be optimized? Uh, and this is obviously for process optimization, not for heating. It could be used there too, but for, for processes that use boilers, the ability throughout the year looking at all the different things, ambient environment, uh, the actual, you know, status of heat and, and def deformation of the metals and, and how, you know, bringing all that together to optimize that. And as well as things as basic as vibration analysis, where uh, you can even get started, uh, you know, with an and look at how to do vibration analysis at a very low cost that in the back end is actually taking advantage of machine learning and AI. Great. Um, next question. Why should device voice be considered a key component um, of any ML solution for uh, industrial IoT and production automation? I think this is a great question and a great reference point. Uh, so thank you. This is a, this is one of those straight men that I love. But okay, uh, you know, really, when I was talking, I talked about how critical good quality data is to being able to either build a model or deploy a solution uh, based upon machine learning AI. And I think that that uh, is where device-wise shines, uh, high integrity. On the on the second, you know, data, you know, coming in, being provided, you know, in a, in a 
well-known format is critical to supplying that system. The ability to filter out using edge logic, you know, outliers or, or bad data elements so that if what you end up with in the context of your data repository is viable data uh, to build that that model off of. Um, so I think that's that's critical, the ability to leverage the edge, obviously, to allow, you know, one of the most important things to keep in mind is try to get those logic decisions as close to the process as you can. And there's nothing that does that edge processing better than device-wise. So the ability, whether you're just doing basic, you know, mathematics and, 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 and yes, no, high, low, or you're full up deploying a, a machine learning model at the edge, uh, DeviceWise provides an excellent uh, deployment platform to make that a success for you. Great, thanks, John. Um, we are coming up on time here, um, so I'm gonna grab just one more question, and this is kind of a nice one to end on. Um, do you see widespread machine learning or AI solutions for manufacturing being a reality in the near future? Uh, he says deep breath. <laughs> Anyhow, dear future, definitely on the horizon. I mean, I am so excited. I was on a call last week hearing about a vibration analysis solution where they actually allow a customer to get started the same day they get their sensors because what they allow you to do is select from a collection of pre-built models because it's vibration. So they're saying, okay, you know, what's the mass of your device? What's the, the diameter of the shaft? What's the horsepower of the motor? What's the RPMs? They've taken this and put it all together and come up with some predefined models so you can get started there very quickly. And then on the back end, it starts to learn based upon your specific data, the specific data that's being collected from the accelerometer and the sensors at the edge. It starts to build on that. So I think, you know, having these optimized solutions where they're focused on a specific thing, they provide you kind of quick start methods to get started. I think this is really going to be opening the door uh, to allow us to see, you know, uh, you know, more traction and, and more proliferation of MLAI-based solutions in the manufacturing domain. It's there's nothing new here. It's always the keep it simple. You know, that's that's the challenge here. So in this particular scenario, the vendor's keeping it simple while enabling, uh, you know, the, the customer to enjoy the benefits of, you know, machine learning and AI uh, over time. You know, as as it learns from their particular system. So I think these types of solutions are really, you know, the ones to watch as we move forward, uh, you know, seeing, you know, uh, machine learning, you know, bring to bear to support digital transformation. Fantastic. Um, I believe that is all the time we've got for today. Um, John, thank you so much. That was such a such a great presentation. Um, God, we could get through a couple of those questions. Um, audience, please be sure to check your inboxes in the coming days. We will send out this replay link. Um, John, thanks again, and thank you to all who joined us.